Again, this is my huge pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Eric Knudsen, uh, who's going to join us today for this session. Um, so this is our second session in a second um, series um, of what I now call rebellious research. So uh, a seminar series I um, started last year at the beginning of the last year, uh, which is aimed at helping and supporting anyone working with practice based research. So um, I'm just going to flag very quickly that we just started a podcast as well, which is called Taming uh, Your Inner Artist. And Eric has very, very kindly said he will join us uh, and record the session with us as well. So this is not uh, everything from Eric, <laughs> not just today's session. And I'm really, really, uh, really excited uh, about today's session. I'm not going to I'm not going to hide this. So I'm just going to pass it to you, Eric. I'm going to stop shake my screen. If you, be, if you could be so kind to introduce yourself and 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 the next hour is yours. So thank you so much and really looking forward to what's going to happen right now. Agatha, thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting me. It seems like you've got a wonderful seminar series going and uh, the fact that you're so committed to practice based research is, is wonderful to see. So I'm really pleased to be able to contribute uh to your to your series and and uh, today i'm going to talk about uh impact but i suppose um uh, uh, by way of, by way of introduction one, one of the things um i suppose to start with is is uh, you, you can see these guitars in the background i used to be a musician before i discovered film and uh, i had the great privilege actually of going to film school in in canada in toronto before coming back to the uk and and mainly living in London for many years, working uh, as a screenwriter, as a theatre director, and then eventually managing to get my first film off the ground for Channel 4 back uh, in 1990. Uh, so it goes back a few years, and then and then of course I came into the academy, and um, at a time I think a very interesting time because the whole idea of practice-based research because there was a whole bunch of people coming in from industry into an ever-expanding media education market in HE, this question of research has been uh, on the agenda for quite a few years now, coming up to 25, 30 years. And I've been very fortunate to be part of that debate over the years uh, and hopefully made some contribution to it. And in many ways, you know, uh, it's about how we progress that debate, and that's what I what I want to talk a little bit about today. So I I came into I started at the University of Salford, uh, quickly went on to be head of production at the Northern Film School, where I was for about two and a half years before coming back to Salford, and running the MA in documentary production, and then I started the MA in fiction film production, and then the MA in wildlife documentary production and gradually uh, took a, a greater interest, obviously, in PhD students and became director of graduate studies at Salford for the whole university before becoming a head of school of media, music and performance at a time when we were moving into media city. So I was heavily involved in, in, in Salford's move into media city. And, and all, all that time, of course, I've been consistent in being a filmmaker. So. <laughs> I have uh, I, I've been running my own film production company, One Day Films, uh, all of that time, and that company has been uh, basically making making my films, and that's the sort of vehicle I've used to to make my films. More recently, I, I spent had a brief period at Bournemouth University, where I was a research professor for a year and a half before coming to UCLan, where I am now, University of Central Lancashire. And um, I came to Lancashire really to help develop the practice based culture because the, there was a recognition that with the REF 2021 coming up, that investment needed to go into making sure that we were capturing as much of that practice as possible for that REF. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And um, part of that then ended up with me for my sins becoming faculty director of research and chairing panel D for REF. For those of you who are not based in the UK, REF uh, is what we call the Research Excellence Framework, which happens about every five to seven years, where the, the Research England captures and measures the quality of the research happening across all of the universities in the UK. I think the current count is about 157 universities. 
and uses that as a basis for allocating research, core research funding. And I'll come back to that because that's very important in terms of impact. And then, you know, as 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 a faculty director of research and chairing panel D, I have overseen. We I oversaw the submission of uh, seven un, uh, no sorry eight units of assessment to the last research excellence framework 20, uh, 2021. and part of that involved overseeing and developing 15 impact case studies. Um, so so. The idea of impact, I think, is very, very important for us to engage with. So that's what I hope we would talk about uh, today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, uh, my screen with you so that I can share a presentation and talk you through some of the issues. And um, at the end, I'm hoping then to uh, foster some discussion and questions and comments uh, so that we can hopefully make some of this relevant to what you might be specifically um interested in so i got i'm going to just share my screen and then um you tell me first of all i'll check with you that i got everything right and then the first time i move the screen i'll tell you that i'm moving it so that you can just confirm with me that it is progressing absolutely <laughs> okay absolutely. so one one moment please yes so you, yes. I hope you can see the screen, the, the yes. presentation. Yes, we do. Yes. We okay. Can. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so I've I've said a little bit about uh, me and my work, and and you know I I should stress the fact that I I see myself very much as a filmmaker. You know, first and foremost. Um, and you know, those of you who are interested, you can catch some of my work um, on Netflix. In fact, and you know, so I, I I have that sort of commercial side, in a sense, to to my work, and and I suppose when we I'll talk a little bit about that sort of personal side of things in terms of impact um, a, a little later. But I wanted to raise this issue of impacts, and that that word impact is not actually everybody doesn't use that word so bear with me as i use that word um, because i know people like the leverhulme trust and so on don't particularly like the word impact but basically what i mean by impact is what difference do we make as researchers you know we 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 do research we uh, disseminate that research and the question is so what um, so that's what I wanted to explore with you a little bit uh, today. So I'm going to first of all talk a little bit about the uh, overall policy landscape, uh, some of the kind of key things that are going on at policy level, and then to talk a little bit about um, what is impact and what is actually being um, assessed when people assess what impact research has. And then I thought I'd look at a case study, my my own impact case study. So I had an impact case study that was submitted to um, Research Excellence Framework 2021. Um, so I thought I'd just take you through that and uh, discuss how those elements I had in that project fit into that um, impact agenda. And then I wanted to finish off by really um, uh, asking a number of questions around some challenges around how we think about these agendas and how that might relate to us personally and our personal ambitions um, and then after that to sort of open up for questions and and discussion so um i'm just trying to see if my slide is progressing let's have a look Nothing is happening. I can't see it moving. Yes, I think we. Have you see, are you seeing anything moving? No, I think we're still on slide one. Very odd. We have tested that everyone. So yeah, we tested it yesterday, didn't we? <laughs> let me just let me just start again. Because something is frozen. I can see that something is frozen. My whole system is frozen. Excuse me while I try and 
you can hear me tapping away, can you? <laughs> uh, we have plenty of time, so don't worry at all. <laughs> I might, Agatha, I might need, because my whole system is just frozen, so I might just need to um, log out and log back in again, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Because I, I can't understand why. It's funny that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. We can see you quite quite well. But yeah, of course, by all means. And you can see my presentation. We can still see your presentation and it disappears right now. We I think we can see the second slide or maybe it was your ah, Yes. Yes, it's happening okay. right now. Okay. Yes. Something happened. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um so Really, I suppose the whole thing, uh, all of this starts, and I know most of you will, in one way or another, be practitioners, artists, actually driven by uh, an in, an in some kind of intent. And for me, it's, you know, I suppose one way or other, I want to change myself and change the world in which I live in to a, for, for a, you know, to a better place. And there is an underlying motivation that I think I've brought from, from my creative um, practice into academia. And I suppose always as an exploring artist, that idea of exploring and interrogating and um, looking at new ways of expressing myself and so on is a natural part of uh, my creative practice anyway. So I think the issue has been how to then take that and translate that into um, a research journey and to think and to think about the you know what is the difference in a sense between me as an artist working independently of academia and me as a research led artist working within the the academy and this is where we've been on a sort of soul searching journey for many years across, you know across the across the sector trying to understand our role within the academy what you know what is an artist doing and the tensions that exist between the kind of strategic and institutional requirements of a university and what we are trying to do as as artists and this is where i find it very important to be able to talk the same language as our colleagues in different disciplines and i think one of the things i've learned over the years is the fact that you know i i need to be able to particularly as I, you know, as a faculty director of research and a chair of panel D, trying to get money for our researchers from the core research budgets, I have to be able to go in and talk with my colleagues in medicine and engineering, computer science, in the health areas, and argue the case for the importance of creative practice research, and in my case, filmmaking research, and its relevance to some of the big headline uh, challenges that research is trying to deal with. And we have to be able to uh, articulate what we're doing in a way where others from outside of our discipline can actually see the relevance of what we're doing. And this is where impact comes in. I think increasingly with government expenditure uh, uh, on, on research actually being quite substantial, I think government perhaps quite rightly is asking research councils and others who are in, in receipt of the, these funds to justify um, you know, what the impact is of this, of this investment. And we need to be able to come back and talk about this in relation to our creative practice research. Already we know that the whole impact agenda is going to become more and more important as we move forward. And one aspect I, I often think about, we talk about creative practice research, but in many ways I like to just talk about research. I mean, what we want to try and avoid is a situation in which people are kind of shuffling off or, or siphoning off the idea of practice-based research somehow being different from the idea of research. So um, I want to just take you through some of those policy uh, challenges and, and, and so that we can contextualize uh, some of that debate in the wider picture, because I think it's very important for us as a, as a creative practice community to start thinking beyond the sort of naval 
gazing aspects of trying to understand what research is and 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 how we accommodate ourselves in the academy to start looking at how we can impact on the world around us and how we can sit at in at the top table so to speak and argue the case for the importance of creative practice research and let me give you let me start off by giving you a little example of that i always remember a story told by Baroness Amos about a visit she made to a, a refugee camp in northern Kenya a few years ago at the height of the, the Sudanese um, civil war. And in that refugee camp, she met this woman who was from South Sudan, who had left South Sudan um, during the war and walked to northern Kenya. And she started off her journey with four children and arrived with none. Now, the point that Baroness Amos was saying was that the scientifically led research activity and as uh, sorry, the, 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 the sort of research led activity that has led to the ability to bring good clean water into a refugee camp to build infrastructure and logistics to deliver, you know, really good uh, support, materialistic support for somebody in that situation for all of the refugees, the all of the scientific research that has gone gone into medicines and and treatment pack, you know, packages for people in distress, all of that can be applied to this woman. But when she has been kept alive and she's got a tent over her head and she's got food to eat and water to drink, is that really enough? And this is where I think we in the arts and humanities more broadly can step in. Because in some ways you can say, what is the point of saving a life if that life has no meaning, no purpose? And uh, we in the arts and humanities can play a really significant role in enriching people's lives and making, helping to make people's lives worth living. And I think it's a, that that's just one example of a particular type of situation where I think it's becoming increasingly apparent from certainly some of the senior people in the research community of the importance that uh, arts and humanities can play in some of these global challenges. And I'll, and I'll come back uh, to that in a minute. So I hope, I hope my slide has moved on, Agata. Sorry, yes, it has. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so when we, I think if we look at impact, I think it's important to understand why, why it's becoming an, you know, a kind of hot topic for policymakers, we have a number, and again, uh, apologies. I'm talking here about the UK. Um, we have a number of major funding streams that fund all of the research that's happening in the universities. Of course, in addition to these ones I've listed here, there are, of course, uh, independent and private funds like the Leverhulme uh, Trust and so on who fund research, but they more or less all follow similar patterns. So Research England, I, I just mentioned, is responsible for the research, research excellence framework, which happens every five to seven years. And on the basis of the outcomes of, of that audit, so to speak, of the quality of research, that's taking place across the country, they allocate core funding to the universities. And these sums of money can be quite substantial or they can be quite small. So it, in, in UCLan's case, I think uh, the, the REF results led to a direct investment from Research England of something like seven million pounds plus additional HIFE money on top of that. But you know, somewhere like the University of Oxford will be getting 200 million pounds. And um, I know that uh, Northumbria University, which did really well in this, in this ref, uh, their research income from Research England has gone up to 20 million pounds. 
Manchester Metropolitan, I think it's 15 million pounds. So these are not unsubstantial sums of money that actually funnel through to the to the uh, universities from that research exercise. So that's core grant that universities can spend in whatever way they want. And they don't have to account for it. Uh, the, the tragedy is that many universities let that money actually disappear into the general system and um, and it's not necessarily always invested in supporting research, for example, by uh, buying people's time out to do research. Only some places do that. And we can come back to that issue in a little while. UKRI, which is the UK Research and Innovation, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute, but they are a major investor into research in this in the UK. So they're taking direct money from the government uh, and channeling it really primarily towards government priorities. So the government will have its sort of industrial strategy and various other priorities like healthy aging and so on. And UKRI will receive direct investment for the government to invest into research. Most of that research goes into the research councils. So that's things like the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the uh, Economic and Social Research Council, the Engineering and um, uh, Physical Sciences Research Council, the Medical Research Council, and so on. So they channel money through those research councils, and then we, people like you and I, apply for funding to do various projects. And then, of course, the government itself has uh, a, a number of priorities that it that it uh, sometimes directly funds through special schemes, but generally through UKRI and Research England. And later on, I'm going to come and talk a little bit about personal priorities, because I think one of the challenges we have as creative practitioners, particularly those of us who are very interested in sort of personal work, and, and, you know, um, we're talking often about work that comes from the heart and we want to um, articulate quite personal things in many ways. How do we align those aspirations, those personal aspirations with the agendas and the objectives of major funding bodies? This is the, the challenge for many of us. And I think that if we want to be successful in uh, getting our fair share of some of this investment to do the kind of work that we want to do, we have to find ways in which we can uh, kind of align that personal ambition with the agenda, the agendas uh, that these research um, bodies are, are are trying to address, and. Inevitably, that means we need to understand the impacts that they are trying to achieve and to align our work with those impacts. And if you look, for example, if we look a little bit more specifically at, at uh, Research England uh, and the REF exercise, I've just picked two of the units of assessments, is 33 and 34. Uh, 33 is um, performance, music, uh, film, theory and practice, and unit 34 is media and communications. And I think that most of us who are working with film will be in one of those two units of assessment. And then within those units of assessment, you then you have various categories of outputs like, you know, books. Um, uh, journal articles, uh, reports, etc. And one of those outputs is defined as digital and visual media. So I think in the practice areas, we would be predominantly captured within, within um, that digital and visual media outputs. Now, what's very interesting is, you know, in UA33, 29% uh, of those outputs submitted. So that's, that's from, you know, um, <clears throat> people working with performance, music, uh, film, are non-text, effectively, um, they're, they're um, practice-led. But interestingly, only 95 actual outputs were captured within digital and visual media, which I find very interesting. So it's quite a small number, actually. But when you look at the quality of these outputs, you realize 
when you talk about four star and three star, for those who are not based in, in the UK, four star means that the work is deemed to be world leading. And three star means that the work is deemed to be internationally significant. And those two levels are levels that get funding. Um, that's why I'm not mentioning one and two. And uh, UA33 had 197 impact case studies. And um, this is quite a sub, you know, substantial number. So each unit of assessment had to submit a certain number of impact case studies, depending on how many members were in that unit of assessment. Now you look similarly with UA34, we have really high levels of world leading and internationally significant work and uh, across 149 impact case studies. Now, this assessment is what is determining the amount of money that each university gets for research from the core grant. So I can't quite remember uh, what a four star output uh, tracks, but it's a substantial number of uh, amount of money. I know that in the case of impact case studies, we have calculated that an impact case study that is deemed to be four star, in other words, world leading, will attract about 125,000 pounds per year from that core grant. Yeah. So the uh, you can see how the importance of these impact case studies to universities uh, can make a significant difference to the research income. So our university, I think we submitted something like 15 impact, sorry, 50 impact case studies, of which 15 came from um, our panel D. So that's arts and arts and humanities. Um, now we know also Research England have already indicated, you know, so currently when they're assessing, um, uh, making assessments of these units of assessment, currently 60% is based on the quality of the outputs, 25% on impact, on the basically the impact case studies, and 15% on environment, which is things like income generation and PhD completions. But Research England have already indicated <clears throat> that the proportion of their assessment on impact is going to go up for the next ref. So we already know that impact case studies are going to be scored more highly, are going to feature more prominently in, in their assessment of uh, research. So another reason for us to think about it. And you can see why uh, the institutions are very interested in, in certainly in our case <clears throat> now, it would be very hard to become a reader and above if you're not leading or heavily involved with an impact case study. That's the importance they are placing on, on these impact case studies moving forward. If you look at UKRI, um, this is the uh, main body that's funding the research councils. <clears throat> Over the next three years, the government is putting 25 billion pounds into research. I mean, this is not this is not an unsubstantial amount of money, but look at the small proportion that the Arts and Humanities Research Council get in proportion to, for example, the uh, Economic and Social Research Council or the uh, um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Nevertheless, 206 million pounds over the next three years is, is coming into the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and that is the kind of natural body that we might go to as film practitioners. But not exclusively, because there are increasing opportunities for transdisciplinary work, and I know that that you know our colleagues in the sciences are very, very keen to work with artists and filmmakers of various kinds, partly because they need to invigorate and reinvigorate some of their own methodologies and some of their own uh, projects. And you can see there, I've just given some examples uh, of some of the kind of strategic objectives that these research councils um, are working to. And in many ways, they are often collaborating in order to encourage transdisciplinary working, in order to deal with some of these global challenges, <laughs> national challenges and so on. 
And I will come back to that a little bit in, in relation to the global challenges uh, uh, when I talk about my, my case study example. So huge sums of money and impact is at the heart of it because uh, basically government is saying we're putting 25 million into it and we want to know what impact this is having on a, in a number of areas and I'll list those areas in a minute in a minute for you. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit about what do we actually mean by impact and I think because sometimes there's a little bit of uh, confusion uh, around that but you can see basically we're looking for an effect some kind of change or some kind of benefit. And I think what people often get confused about is, th is this thing about reach and significance. And I think, you know, w one thing to be clear about is that having impact is not about the scale on which something is achieved. So in other words, you know, uh, whether you whether you reach a certain number of people, like with a film, let's say you're super popular or you you uh, win a number of awards or you become famous or whatever. Actually, that's not relevant for for impact. Often, you know, in the early days when we're putting together impact case studies, people would cite things like, well, I have so many Twitter followers or I have, you know, on Instagram, I've had so many likes or or, or whatever, and really that that is more or less irrelevant. That kind. Of, what is what is meant by reach is, for example, you know, you could you could be doing a project with a handful of people who, for example, are hard to reach, but the impact, that the effect, the change, the benefit that can be demonstrated. Uh, for, for particular groups or particular circumstances actually is 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 showing a kind of real innovation and a real significance and significance of course i suppose is, is slightly more difficult to define but relates very much to um uh, the kind of impact that is being uh, achieved so we're looking at impacts on audiences, beneficiaries, communities, constituencies, organizations, or, indiv or individuals. And what we then need to do in a, in a sort of, um, particularly in impact case studies, is to identify the nature of the research itself. Yeah, so the, the research outputs, the new knowledge, the new insights that have been gained from doing that research, and then to uh, identify what impacts and who, who's benefiting and how are they being impacted. And the third element is what is the evidence for the impact? So having lots of Twitter followers or having lots of likes or having or being famous or film doing really well commercially doesn't mean that anything has been changed or that necessarily any, anybody has actually benefited. Um, in, in any significant way. So it's about kind of defining that reach significance, it, the, the link to the research itself and how then to evidence that. And interestingly, you know, when we, uh, and of course that evidence can take the form of both quantitative evidence and qualitative evidence. And I just had a skim through for this presentation, I just had a skim through some of the impact case studies that were submitted to um, to the research to the ref exercise, and I looked at the titles of them, and you it it kind of reveals these are just some example keywords I've extracted from some of these titles, and you can see immediately that these impact case studies are talking about essentially transformation, things, uh, people, circumstances, and so on have been. In, power, raising, developing, enabling, reimagining, influencing. These are all kind of words that would illustrate the idea that changes and effect is happening. And it's these kind of words are appearing in the actual titles of impact case studies. And when you see when you see the kind of areas that they identified as being um, 
impacted areas, they're looking at a number of you know areas like cultural and technological and so on. And you can see that in our in our areas in unit of assessment 33 and unit of assessment 34, we are mainly having impacts in the cultural and societal, which is no surprise. Um, interesting, no no impacts in the in the sort of legal sphere. But um, I was surprised, for example, not to see more impact case studies identifying technological impacts um, or economic impacts, which is um, very interesting in its in its own right. So we're looking. This is a cross section from 341 uh, impact case studies submitted to REF across those two units of assessment. So I think that's just a quick sort of summary of the landscape and the importance of of uh, impact in the agenda. And I thought I'd sort of flesh that out by looking at my own impact case study and really talk about how, how I've tried to translate what essentially started as a very personal thing and actually remains as a very personal thing in terms of my creative practice, my own personal aims, and how I've tried to link that to some of these bigger agenda items uh, in relation to funding. So I've been doing this project for a number of years now. It uh, started in 2017. It's, we've had uh, two lots of funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council for this. And um, I have, you know, assembled a wonderful team of collaborators from uh, a number of universities across across the world. And in a sense, this this project was really a, about trying to understand, you know, when we look at the democratization of the technology around filmmaking and you see the explosion of filmmaking across the world. I mean, if you go to places, I mean, I've been to we did some work in Ghana and you see the amount of filmmaking going on. It's absolutely amazing. And that explosion in the practice of filmmaking brought about essentially by the democratization of the production and distribution means. Um, we were curious to understand, you know, how that has impacted on the, what I suppose we can call the democratization of the ideation process, you know, the ideas. So if people have become freer to kind of make films and distribute films and reach audiences, how's that impacting on the ideas and the stories they're telling? and the stories they want to tell. And uh, we wanted to find out a little bit more about that to, to, to explore then on the basis of that, uh, how, how might one might look at uh, skills training in a, different, in a different kind of way. And certainly when it comes to the impact side of things, that's certainly one of the areas that we were looking, that we were looking at. So, you know, why is this, why did we feel this import, important? I think it's absolutely necessary to, uh, for every one of us really to be in control of our own stories and um, in, in a sense to find mechanisms to do that. And w one of the ways obviously we wanted to look at uh, is, you know, are people actually telling the stories they want to tell? Are they actually in control of their own stories? Who owns who owns their stories? And we 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 think. I mean, I I, I keep thinking about uh, Muriel Rukeyser's quote. She said that the the universe is not made of atoms, but stories. And you realize the funda fundamental importance that stories play in in our lives and our way of understanding the world. And of course, cinema and the film narrative is an important way in which we tell stories now. So we wanted to just explore really about the ideation process itself primarily. We, this is not this was, this was not a project about training people how to write screenplays or to make films. This was a much more about how to um, develop the stories that we actually feel belong to us and that we feel necessary to tell. And we worked, we've worked across the world um we the whole in a sense the story lab concept itself started when i was working in cuba so i've been going to cuba for 
20 or more years, uh, certainly between 1998 and 2018, I went at least once a year. And uh, I started doing these sort of story lab workshops, these ideation workshops. And out of that, um, developed an approach that I then started to explore with my colleagues. And since then, of course, we've done workshops in, in Malaysia, in, in Ghana, in Colombia. Those are the, some of the main places. We've done additional workshops in, in California. And that was a collaboration with um, some archaeology colleagues who were doing the work there. So a kind of transdisciplinary engagement. We've since done work in Greece. We've recently done some workshops in, in the UK as well. So we have a pretty good spread and, you know, wonderful groups of people that we've been working with across the world. Uh, lovely, you know, to discover the kind of stories that people want to tell and how they want to tell them and and to try and find out, um, you know, the importance of these stories in, in their lives. The first, we've, we sort of had two waves in a sense. The first wave was in, in Malaysia, Ghana and Colombia. And then we, uh, where we worked directly, primarily with independent filmmakers. And then we had a second wave where we focused more clearly in Colombia, where we then worked to develop a, a mentorship system where some of the people we'd worked with in the first workshop then went on to do workshops with particular communities in, in two different parts of uh, Colombia. And um, the uh, some of the other workshops, I, I mentioned the uh, California workshops. One of the challenges there was that the archaeologists were, were excavating uh, in the hills just north of Los Angeles and had a real difficulty getting the Native American Indians, or not Indians, but I mean um, Native Americans to actually get involved in the archaeology project. There was little interest. So we use Story Lab as a method of trying to create that engagement and interest in history through the idea of uh, story ideation and, and filmmaking. And I'll show you some clips of what people have done after that. So if we think if we think of it in terms of that journey I described earlier, the research outputs, the claims of impact, and then evidencing the impact, all of this work, in a sense, I can trace back to my own creative practice as a filmmaker, and some of the things I have written around um, film practice and my film practice. And um, I, I published a book in 2018 where I brought this together into a book called Finding the Personal Voice in Filmmaking. And so I can trace back the origin of the claimed impact to these research outputs. And the, this book contains some of the theoretical framing as well as uh, I have incorporated some of the workshop um, uh, findings from here as well, but also links back to my own creative practice around ideation. And out of this, I then worked with my colleagues and we developed a kind of, we'd like to think of it as a, a, new, a, a new methodology we call ethnomediology, which is a kind of um, uh, amalgamation of uh, autoethnography and ethnomusicology, if you can imagine that sort of immersive collaborative engagement with uh, with with people. And then out of that, of course, uh, emerges various practices. And this ethnomediology, um, the sort of theoretical frame is really based around three principles. Uh, one is about integrity, which is really about having an approach that's about equality and mentoring. So we're not talking about teachers and those who are learning. We're not talking about, we're talking about entering into a common uh, space where we are all equal. But on the basis of that, we would develop some mentoring, some approaches to uh, mentoring rather than teaching. At the heart of it is what we call authenticity, which is really about the fact that the methods we're using to create and develop ideas are very much based on connecting right into an individual's feelings and emotions and their dreams and intuitions and memories and so on. 
and that 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 is where the authentic authenticity of the stories actually resides and then we were able to then use a, a method of working in the workshops where we kind of have a very open space where people can be open about quite personal things in some circumstances and where we're not coming with predefined projects or or uh, projects that we want to develop but we are starting from scratch and what is amazing about these workshops is how we discover you know people discover stories that they didn't even know they had in them and that's one of the really interesting things I think we've discovered about the project about about um, people is that kind of ability to discover uh, new uh, stories um, and and to to allow those stories then to emerge and to start to take shape before they get condemned by doubts and 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 um, uh, as I suppose conformity and so on. Now, these workshops, of course, I, I mentioned the fact that we, we, you know, we did the workshops initially, and then we we did a second series of workshops where we co co created um, an approach with our mentors, who then went and worked with um, mentees in different parts of Colombia for the second phase. So, um, for example, there was an indigenous community in northern Colombia um, near Santa Marta who are not recognized by the Colombian government, um, uh, the Chimila tribe, and consequently are excluded from a lot of the kind of opportunities and, and um, initiatives that that government is involved with in terms of, of um, the welfare of its people and so they and they'd never been involved with any kind of uh, sort of a film uh, endeavor or theater endeavor or whatever so the wonderful opportunity for us to go and work with them another group of people we worked with in, in colombia was a group of people who'd been quite badly affected by the civil war in the sense that they were isolated and so we were able to um, create some workshops in that kind of situation, mainly for young people who are isolated from the peace and reconciliation process taking place in Colombia. And we we actually made some claims. So that so so moving on from the source of you know the 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 the, the, the kind of research outcome, the research source, the, the the kind of new insights from from the research, moving into making the claims that we're trying to make about impact, they fall into two broad areas. Basically, we, we're we claiming that we, you know, we are having an impact and, and um, being able to, you know, create a more kind of advanced locally and regionally inspired ideation practices, as well as on the back of that, helping to develop some specific narrative and production skills as part of that process. Now, why is this important? Well, this is where we start to link it into some of the bigger agendas because we then took the United Nations um, 17 sustain Sustainable Development Goals and identified three, three of those goals that our work would have a specific impact in. One of them was number four, quality education. So we're looking at a different way of doing education built around building confidence around ideation you know, developing ideas in the first place and developing a different approach to um, kind of education in, in that area. We were able to address uh, number eight, decent work and economic growth. And, you know, it doesn't, as far as I can see, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, most people have growing media and creative industry sectors, even in some of the poorest parts of the world. And there's no reason why we should not be thinking about some of these areas um, and, and set the creative sector as potential economic growth areas for these countries and therefore providing work and economic opportunities. And of course, core to that is the fact that people can develop ideas. Any healthy creative industry has a really good free flowing um, a context for the development of ideas. And if we're to help develop the creative sectors economically, then we need to embolden and encourage people 
to have confidence in the ideas that they want to develop. So we could address that specific issue as well. And then the third one we were trying to address was around reduced inequalities, number 10. And here again, we feel that, you know, we were able to argue the fact that uh, by helping people to become articulate around their own feelings and aspirations and taking ownership of their own stories, we would help them to be able to communicate and participate more uh, effectively in uh, the fabric of the wider society and thereby helping to reduce inequalities between communities yeah, with, with, within, a, within a country. So these are not necessarily the kind of inequalities that we tend to talk about in the, in the UK, but we're talking about equalities where people are potentially being excluded from the wider fabric of, of, of a society. And we address those issues directly in, in, in our proposals and in, in how we, the, the sort of impact claims that we are making. The third phase of this is how do we evidence this? Well, we did a number of things. I mean, I'll start with what for me is the least interesting part of how we evidence this, which is, you know, the quantitative side of things. And, and for example, I'll just show you here some examples from uh, the Columbia questionnaire with the people that we worked with. We gather some simple data about the impact that the workshops have had on specific activities. Um, everything from, you know, for example, people writing a new script that they might not have done before, or how people feel about their ability to to develop new ideas and their confidence around developing new ideas. So we were able to gather some uh quantitative data around that that helped to illustrate some of these key claims that we're or help to support some of these key claims that we're making then the other type of um which i would i find more interesting the other type of kind of evidence is really qualitative and we were able to we made two quite substantial documentaries about the project um one one was made by uh, Rowena Baldwin. We we hired her to travel to Malaysia and Ghana and Colombia post project to do some uh, semi structured interviews with all the participants. And uh, Pilar Padreca, who's a who's a Colombian filmmaker, she was again also able to go to the various uh, communities where we worked in the second wave and do some uh, interviews and the California project we were able to do some interviews as well and that that project by the way was led by <clears throat> Dr. Yakovos Panagopoulos who was my PhD student at the time and we were able to send him to California to lead those workshops so what we we've done is that collected um, documentary testimonies from all of, from most of the participants and in those testimonies, we've been able to identify particular areas where there has been a change, you know, from uh, how people um, practice the development of their ideas to how they're how they're reengaging with with their um, heritage and histories or whatever it might be. We made specific claims and we then supported that with evidence from uh, testimonies of 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 people and by the way all of, all of all of this material is available on on our on the project website um, storylabnetwork.com and you know these these interviews two documentaries one is half half an hour long and the other is uh, nearly an hour long and in those documentaries we have also embedded some of the outputs that were created as part of the as part of the project and then the sort of second broad area of course was around the actual skills that i think is a secondary almost like a secondary uh, consequence of the development of ideas in some cases the workshops will actually develop story ideas in the form of screenplays in in uh, other workshops, we might actually make finished films. 
So the out the out outputs can actually vary. And again, we interviewed a whole whole bunch of uh, participants who were who were involved in the in the project. Um, I'm going to show you. I hope this is going to work, but I'm going to show you a clip of uh, just some extracts from three of the outputs created by by the um, participants from the uh, Columbia workshops and one from the California uh, workshops. And I think because one of the things that I think is for me one of the best forms of evidence is to see the work that is actually produced by participants. And in, in, in some of these, these cases, these works are now out there in the world. Um, one of them has won a number of awards uh, at, at film festivals, and others are being shared with their communities or shared within the wider local community. But for me personally, it's the evidence of the work of these participants that that clinches it. So I'm going to I'm going to show you just uh, three uh, film, uh, extracts. One is from the um, Chimila tribe in the Santa Marta region of Colombia. That's the first one. And then the second extract is from a, a, a community of young people living near Ibagué in, in sort of more southwestern part of, of Colombia. And then the third extract is going to be from a film made by a group of young people living in, in California. Um, so let me get that going. Oh, Luisa. Ayer hablé con el alcalde y el alcalde nos invita a hacer un sancocho en la playa. Bueno, ya, ya. Pero que llevemos nuestras ollas, platos y cucharas. Con el torrito, ¿será posible llevar mi torrito para sacar agua de la playa? Por supuesto que sí. Primero vayamos donde las autoridades para que nos den la bendición. Pero primero escondamos los sí, escondamos nuestras tabacos. ¿Cuál es el plan del gobierno de ellos? ¿Alguna pregunta? Los candidatos han llegado a dialogar con la mesa de autoridad, con los mayores y las mayoras. Ya ellos se han hecho de hacer buena. Bueno. Sí, muy buena. Nena, a la orden. Vengo a informarles que quiero ser cabildo. Bueno, mire que cara tú con fui hombre está ego de naca ti está cranti me ca cuanura hombre te huesa hombre te yo quiero ser su cabildo porque he visto la necesidad de que nuestros cultivadores sigan sembrando los alimentos tradicionales. Mi nombre es Azul y aquí estoy, celebrando el que siempre pensé sería el día más importante de mi vida, mi cumpleaños número 27. Hoy, viernes 27. Hoy, 
pero tristemente es el primero sin mi abuelo, el loco, el encargado de heredar en mí el amor por la música y todo su misterio. Como es natural, tuvo que partir al cielo, según mi abuela. Me pregunto si hoy habría desaparecido misteriosamente, como todos los viernes 27. El viejo la hizo de nuevo, pero esta vez para siempre. Te traje este regalo que trajo tu abuelo. ¿Tú quieres llevarlo? Pues sí. O si no, puedes dejarlo. Se 
One of the unpredicted impacts we had, for example, in this last ex example extract from California is the fact that the intergenerational conversation around heritage was not taking place. These young girls and some of the other young people had little interest in, in their own history. And what the project was able to do was to foster a new conversation between the older generation and the younger generation that then has had subsequent impacts in terms of how they've engaged with the archaeology uh, projects and other projects related to the landscape and the history of the area. So that's that's a very, um, very interesting um, outcome. On the back of all of this, so I hope you, you've been able to see that, you know, how I've sort of connected the personal research embedded in my own practice, how we have, you know, then developed a way of marrying up some of the ideas and themes into the strategic objectives of some of the major funders. And, and, and the impacts they are looking to address. Now, I think there are, you know, having done this project, I have a lot of concerns and, um, you know, not least the fact that the amount of money that we spend on research, particularly research that's going into work with um, the other. I mean, there's no doubt that I think, in my view, we who work in academia are part of the intellectual elites. And we are in recipient of, uh, you know, across the board, we're in, re in receipt a lot of research funding that enables us to go and work with communities and peoples um, locally and internationally. And I think one of the challenges of that, of course, is that the relationships you have with people you're working with. I mean, we're coming with the money and no matter how much we pretend that we're trying to co-create and trying to be equal and trying to be um, egalitarian about our relationships, I think there's always going to be a skewed um, a skewed relationship in one in one way or another. And I think it's very it's very easy, I think, to see that how in certain situations, of course, people want to please on the one hand and would want to engage in projects and participate. And but the money ultimately does the talking. And I think there is an imp there is a discussion to be had about to what extent we uh in this process are actually imposing um certain perspectives on certain problems i mean to give you you know sim simple example we might assume that people who are poor uh, are unhappy and uh this is in a sense in many ways a projection that we are projecting on on people because we have for example a particular a uh, materialistic view of the world, for example, that some other people uh, don't. And I sometimes wonder to what extent our um, good intentions sometimes maybe are, are, are do not have good impacts. And I think this is something that we ought to uh, examine and, and, and look at, and maybe we can discuss in, in more detail. But I, I, I sense that, you know, we have our agendas, our governments, our institutions, our funding bodies 
have their agendas and those agendas can shape how we project onto others the kind of problems that we think they have. And because of the money relationship, we 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 have a kind of acquiescence going on to some to a to a certain degree. This is not, and you see this in the arts uh, when you look at, for example, the Arts Council uh, funding strategies or the British Film Institute funding strategies. You can see that what we see that is funded is not necessarily a reflection of what is actually happening in, in on the ground, but is a reflection of the values that the decision makers and the policy makers are actually uh, concerned with. And this is an issue that I think um, is exercising me a great deal in terms of future projects and how to take my story lab project forward in the future. This is not a problem confined to the arts. You know, uh, there's a lot of recent activity in uh, around the sciences that, you know, we assume that because, you know, science is based on the idea that if you re replicate uh, a, a methodology, then you should get the same results. And it turns out not to be the case at all. And even in the sciences, there is an acknowledgement that in order to get published in the top journals, and in order to get significant sums of research funding, you have to produce results that talk to the zeitgeist of those strategies. Now, what that means often is that people will take data and they will skew that data to tell the story that needs to be told. And I'm so conscious of that in terms of filmmaking and ideas development, that when you go and work with people, there the can also be a tendency for people to want to tell the stories that they think you're interested in because actually you're coming with the funding and you are coming with the, uh, the project ideas and so on and so forth. So I think there is a general issue to be discussed across all of research around the um, around the some of the efficacy of what we are of, of what we're doing. And I know this is very hard sometimes for um, people uh, to deal with. but in 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 my view, the, the the you know some of the most interesting innovations are probably happening on the fringes of where the main funding is going and perhaps outside it at all. Certainly, if we look at the history of the arts and sciences, we can see plenty of examples of how genuine innovations were actually created by people who were rejected by their own peers. So I come back, in a sense, to kind of bring things to a close. I come back to really um, where, where I started, in a sense, with, with the personal, you know, how do we find a way of um, having impacts, of making a difference for those of us who are interested in personal work and our personal aspirations. And I take heart from the feedback from the Research Excellence Framework in 2014, where, you know, it's clear that at the highest of level, there is a recognition that not only do creative arts play an important part or potentially play an important part in addressing some of our, of our challenges, um, but that it's perfectly possible to do personal work from which wider significance and wider impacts can be evidenced. And part of this is, is, is how, we, how we evidence it, how we talk about research, how we um, uh, seek to uh, identify the links between our personal ambitions and the needs of wider society. So, Agata, I think I'm going to end here and just open up to uh, questions, comments, etc. And I hope that everybody's still there because I've just been looking at a screen. I've just been looking at my own presentation. <laughs> so are you still there? there? We definitely still here. Thank you so much. Like, it was just so 
uh, inspiring and so insightful as always, um, you know, whenever you, you share your, your experience. So thank you so much for that. And, and with a twist at the end, when you kind of give us a little bit of a curveball in terms of uh, uh, thinking about impact. So really fascinating and, and, and fascinating examples from your personal experience. So thank you so much. So all I'm going to do, I'm going to take the, um, I'm going to use my privilege of person who's sharing this. I'm going to ask my first question if that's okay. And then we're going to take questions from the public. But I have million of questions, but I'm just going to settle with one at the moment. So uh, I'm thinking about young researchers, uh, early careers, PhD students, and very often uh, when they come from creative um, arts and practices, and they already uh, sometimes struggle or feel a bit intimidated when they have to almost match what they're doing with their creative work into the requirements of academia. And, uh, and again, this is a different conversation we, we don't have time for, but obviously uh, the, the idea of rigor, how you evidence that as well. And obviously when, we come, when it comes to impact, it is a huge task as well, because you need to plan for it in advance and in terms of evidencing, as we've seen on your example, it's sometimes uh, almost a bigger job than the project itself. So. Let's imagine there is an early career researcher or PhD student who works on something really uh, unusual, creative, design new methodologies for how to develop uh, different strands of film language, if you like. How, what would you advise to people like that to, to <laughs> uh, when it comes to thinking about impact? And, uh, you know, at what stage should they start to worry about things like that? Well, this is a great question because it goes to the heart of the, pro the problem in, in many ways. I mean, let us remember that, you know, had Einstein been living in this, this age, a lot of his research would not have been funded because he wouldn't have been able to evidence impact. So we got to, I think we, we got to just put this in perspective and say that not, not all research has to lead to immediate impact. You know what I mean? So I think every as a, as an individual, you can kind of try and evaluate, you know, where you sit in this picture. I think I'm mainly I'm mainly making the point really that if people want to have serious money, if they want to um, bring in money to their university, and that way to create leverage from, for, for themselves, for example, within the university system, then they need to think about how they engage with the impact strategy. I think it's, it's, there's, there's also room for blue skies research where people are experimenting with things and have no idea what impact it's going to have. I think we need to have room for that as well. But going to the to the specific issue of somebody who does want to engage with that agenda, I think part of it is to build impact evidencing into the research design itself. Yeah. So so to think, you know, when one's putting together some kind of project to think about, yeah, right from the beginning to think about how am I going to make that link between my new insights the, it, what what am I trying to change in this world? What am I, you know, am I trying to change the form, some of the processes, or am I trying to engage with some of the great, the, the grander themes? What what am I trying to do with this research? And then thirdly, how, how am I going to build evidencing into the project itself? And that does require some thinking and, and sitting down with colleagues and, you know, sharing some thoughts, thoughts around this. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. But I think I think one of the things, you know, I, I always say if somebody comes to me, I want to do this project, I want to do this project, and I always say, why? Yes. And I think if we can answer that question, why? And we can answer the question, why me? And we can answer the question, why now? We will have gone a long way to dealing with impact questions. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a fantastic answer. And uh, I, I really am happy to hear that you think that there's um, space as well for research, which, you know, can be a little bit more experimental, because I do think that it has value as well in terms of, you know, opening our minds and, and be a little bit more creative. And uh, I think there should be space for both. But does it mean I'm just going to do a follow up and I promise I, I, I move on to what's in there. <laughs> but um, does it mean that um, 
let's say in your example, Eric, so when you when you start working on a new film, for example, does it mean that at the beginning you decide, well, this is going to be um, academic style filmmaking project and hence you're going to plan for this? Or does it <laughs> come no, there's, all, there's always an element of retrofitting, isn't there? I think particularly in the, in the, crea in the creative arts, you know, what, what I would call practice as research as opposed to practice led research you know where you're reflecting on things i think you know in in my case you could you could make a link between my films and some of my processes involved in the film so it's not necessarily that the film itself is going to have impact but that some of the processes which is the case with me some of the processes i used in creating those films i've then applied and it's it's those that are having the impact I don't see why, you know, I mean, everybody who, well, when I make a film, I want to have an impact. I want to, I want to move somebody. I want to change them potentially. I want to whatever. Evidencing that is much more difficult. Um, and, you know, it, so, so that is a challenge, of course, you know, how, how do you, how does an individual film cause impact? Well, if you can link some kind of behavioral change or some kind of, you know, if you could, for example, uh, demonstrate that a particular approach uh, in a particular film has influenced other filmmakers, um, you know, that's, I think that's a little bit more difficult. I mean, uh, one of my colleagues, you know, Turner Prize winning colleague, Lubena Himid, she, you know, her work, has had tremendous impact on because uh, she's from Mauritius originally has had tremendous impact on black female artists in this country but very importantly on curating policies of some of the major galleries yeah so where so what what we've been able to do there is to link her art to the impact of the fact that, oh, there are more black female artists who are exhibiting and, and create a direct link, and then a direct link to policy. That that's the golden goose when it comes to impact. If you can show that you've impacted policy, yeah. they love it. Yeah. 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 That's really wonderful. But I think it's more difficult just if you just single out the film itself and don't link some of the other elements going on around the filmmaking. Yeah, I think th this is why I was asking this question, and you said something really important, which I I I I want to kind of highlight it, uh, highlight here. So so it's the processes very often which are around the pro the, 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 the filmmaking itself, which are leading towards those impacts. And the example you've just given is just really proving that. So that's really wonderful. That's that's really inspiring. So we have a couple of questions here. I'm just going to very quickly go back. So really uh, nice comments. So perfect examples of connecting research out with and personal society, uh, societal impact. Great insights. That's from um, Aishi. Um, then we have another comment that was insightful. Thank you for sharing your personal experience and creative practice. Fantastic presentation, reflections and strategies, useful question. Um, that's about a question. Thank you, very interesting. And here we have questions. What advice do you have for PhD students who are new in practice-led research? For example, using film to gather data for research, considering that audiovisual recordings as data do not necessarily resonate with te theories and concepts that inform dominant approaches to research in social sciences. Very interesting. I mean, I don't know so much about the social sciences, but I think, you know, there's a, there's quite a long tradition of people using audiovisual material as data, you know, uh, visual anthropologists. I know visual sociologists use audiovisual materials. Uh, some of my own students use audiovisual materials and then, for example, use the process of editing as a method of analysis, yeah? So I think there's all sorts of interesting ways of using creative practice that is not necessarily about the practice itself, but it's about some other subject. And my advice is to be courageous, that you can do, you know, whatever you want, so long as you're, rig so long as you're rigorous. And people, I think, often overcomplicate this issue of research. I think, you know, I, I think the UN's definition is something along the lines of some kind of systematic inquiry that leads to a new insight that 
you know, uh, for the benefit of humankind. Yeah, that's the impact for the benefit of humankind. Systematic inquiry means that there's uh, some system to it. So even if you're sitting under a tree every morning and meditating before you start writing your script, I would talk about that as method. And I think what so my my advice would be to be courageous in the way one thinks about methodologies and the way one thinks about uh, incorporates existing creative practice and talk about it as a method. That's, that's and to have the courage to do that, because, of course, we are the experts. Nobody else knows our field like we do. So I think all we have to be able to demonstrate is we've been rigorous and that we there's some kind of system to what we're doing. That, that's really wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. So we have uh, one more question. I think we have time for just one. I'm so sad that the time went so quickly. Um, so the question is, with the new stories and teaching filmmaking, how do you do this? Are you bringing it? Are you bringing in story structure or allowing the, allowing them to work outside of the normal Western Hollywood script writing conventions? That's very much at, at the heart of it, because we don't this is not about teaching craft. So this this is about giving people some mechanisms and some um, strategies for allowing stories to emerge in fairly free form in those early stages. And then later on, we start talking about structure once. But what, what we what we found is that most ideas that people have are killed off before they have a chance to to even see the light of day. And the, the reason often is because of conventions, expectations, fears, uh, places people don't want to go, you know, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. So what we're dealing with is really that really early stage of a gestation process that allows a story to emerge and take shape in whatever form it, it wants to take shape. And then, of course, we can st start to bring to bear some of the traditions, some of the approaches as it has once it has got it, once it's seen the light of day. And I think what we very much avoid imposing uh, existing structures before that first ideation uh, has actually has actually happened. And I think that's the difference between what we're doing. We're not teaching people how to write screenplays. We are helping. Uh, if I could put it very simply, we are simply helping people to have the courage to trust in the imagery that wants to naturally emerge from their hearts. That's a wonderful way to protect your creativity as well. Yeah. Before you apply the rigor, I really love it. I, I, I can see uh, Becky's comment here. Manu Mantra, be courageous. Thank you for hugely valuable insights in relation to creative practice and academic research. And then uh, I don't think we have time for this, but there, there's maybe very quickly a follow up question. And do people have lots of different ways to tell their stories? Yes. I mean, I, I, I happen to think I think the first thing I do is I separate out story and narrative. And I think that s s many stories are actually the same <laughs> over time. You know, you can see you can see that there are certain prototypical stories that keep popping up in different cultures over long periods of time, but they find many different narrative expressions. So you you will you will see, I don't know, the story of Gilgamesh is actually the same story as Star Wars, but they're 5,000 years apart and they have different narrative forms speaking to different times and different contexts. So, in, so, in, so by separating out story and narrative like that, you then suddenly become liberated as a filmmaker because you suddenly realize, yeah, actually I can tell any story I want with whatever I've got, wherever I am, because the story might have universal qualities to it, but the narrative is what you've got where you are and you, you tell the story with those elements. 
Thank you so much, Eric. You, you're really inspiring. I have to say that I said it here many oh, times. Oh, I appreciate it. I hope everybody's found it useful. <laughs> and uh... Uh, Extremely. So thank you so much once again. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, I hope there's going to be lots of other opportunities uh, for us to have this discussion. Thank you, everyone. So the, the session is recorded, has been recorded, is recorded, and it will be uh, available on the um, YouTube channel for the seminar, probably later today or tomorrow. And uh, just wanted uh, to, to say very quick announcements. So obviously, because next month is December, our next session will actually happen in two weeks time. It's not going to be last Wednesday of December because we will all be uh, eating our Christmas dinners. Uh, so it's in two weeks time and we have um, a double bill next uh, next time. So we have um, Dr. Roy Honey from um, Southampton Solent University and Ben Habisher, Habisher, who is the head of MEXA practice. And they're going to be talking about some really nice, exciting things in two weeks time, the same time in the same place, new link. But thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. And once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for listening. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.